The effect of Arrakis on the mind of the newcomer usually is that of overpowering barren land. The stranger might think nothing could live or grow in the open here, that this was the true wasteland that had never been fertile and never would be. In Frank Herbert's beloved series of books, one of the main themes that are explored is the impact people can have on an ecosystem and vice versa, and understanding the consequences of changing the relationships that exist within that system. In this video, I'd like to talk about the environment of this deadly desert planet and how Frank Herbert carefully crafted this world to be a case study in ecological cause and effect. This is a theme that will most likely make its way into Denis Villeneuve's upcoming adaptation of Dune as well. But before we continue, I would like to issue a spoiler warning as I'll be discussing details related to crucial plot points within Frank Herbert's Dune and some information from subsequent sequel novels. On its surface, Arrakis consists almost entirely of arid deserts. This is the reason for the planet's alternative name, Dune. There are various mountain ranges along with rocky outcroppings scattered across the planet. These serve to break up the seas of endless sand and provide shelter to the limited native life forms that call Arrakis their home. The traditionalist Fremen tribes use these rocky locations and the caves within as a place of residence. Deep within the mountains of Arrakis is where vast reserves of water exist, containing countless sand trout, which are a larval form of sandworms that resemble large leeches or slugs. The atmosphere of Dune consists of nitrogen and oxygen. It's breathable by humans, allowing them to inhabit Arrakis without needing any respiratory equipment. It's revealed later in the books that the metabolic systems of the mighty sandworms act like an oxygen-producing factory, enabling them to produce enough of the gas to sustain limited biological life on the planet. A sandworm's internal workings can be likened to that of a massive blast furnace, which produces intense heat and flames. This furnace provides the environmental link of introducing oxygen back into the ecosystem. Small amounts of water vapor also exist in the atmosphere and are harvested via wind traps, which are essentially large air intakes, allowing the moisture to be captured and extracted by the local Fremen people after it condenses and is funneled to a catch basin. The capital city of Arakeen is located on the northern pole of the planet. The entire area sits on a large plate of bedrock and is surrounded by mountain ranges. The geography affords the area protection from the activity of sandworms. This, along with the milder climate, makes human habitation at the pole much more comfortable. Because of its scorching heat and dry climate, not much life is able to survive on Dune. The dominant life form are the massive sandworms which evolve from the aforementioned sand trout. For more information on these creatures, be sure to check out my video, The Life Cycle of the Sandworms, where I dive into details surrounding the development and growth of these dragon-like beasts. A few other creatures are also known to inhabit Arrakis, such as the kangaroo mouse, which is known to the natives as Moadib. The Fremen people admire this creature due to its hardiness and ability to survive in the open desert. Aside from this desert mouse, there are other forms of burrowing animals, including the kit fox, the desert hare, and the sand terrapin. Various bats and birds can also be found on Arrakis, including desert hawks, eagles, and dwarf and desert owls. Some of these creatures were even domesticated by the Fremen. Insect life is also present on Dune, mostly arthropods such as the trapdoor spider, biting wasps, scorpions, centipedes, and the worm fly. While sparse, there are a few forms of plant life that grow on the planet. One of the more useful plants is called the creosote bush, the leaves of which the Fremen would rub on their hands to prevent perspiration whenever they need to remove their gloves to perform more delicate work. There are quite a few other varieties of desert flora, including grasses, shrubs, bushes, cacti, and flowering plants. Life has come to adapt in this harsh environment over thousands of years, However, it was not always like this. The discovery of large salt flats on Arrakis by Imperial planetologist Pardo Kynes serves as evidence that the planet once had lakes and oceans. 
to explain the disappearance of these bodies of water in Frank Herbert's Children of Dune, it is revealed that the sand trout, which were also known as water stealers, were brought to Arrakis from elsewhere long ago. These creatures were the cause of the disappearance of this water as they relocated it deep under the surface of the planet. In the book, Lady Jessica brings out that wells drilled in the sinks and basins initially produce a trickle of water, but that it soon stops, as if something plugs it. This is no doubt due to the continued presence and activity of sand trout throughout the environment as they live to seek out water and sequester it in the depths below. Dune is unique in that it is the only world where the substance known as melange or spice is found. The entire infrastructure of civilization across the universe depends on it. Spice, among other uses, is the substance that extends life and makes safe interstellar travel possible. It is revealed throughout the course of Frank Herbert's first novel that this precious commodity is actually a byproduct of the life cycle of the sandworms. Thus, it is ultimately the sandworms that have terraformed Arrakis, making them the key to why this planet stands as the center of all power and influence in the universe. The fight for survival in this harsh world proved to be a dominant force that formed the Fremen's cultural identity. The brutal environment of Arrakis necessitated their careful use of energy and resources, especially water. This greatly contributed to the Fremen's emergence as efficient and hardy warriors, who used their skills and the environment of Arrakis to defend themselves from the technologically advanced offworlders who would seek to oppress them. In a plan hatched under the guidance of Imperial planetologist Pardo Kynes and carried on by his son Liet Kynes, the Fremen people began work to terraform Arrakis in order to turn it into a lush, green, and rich environment once again. To accomplish this, they collect water in underground reservoirs, which are located mostly in the unexplored southern latitudes of the planet. These reservoirs are stocked with predator fish that attack any invading sand trout. These water caches would serve to eventually become Dune's new lakes and oceans. By the time of the events of Children of Dune, it is revealed that the attempts to transform the ecology of Arrakis would alter the sandworm cycle which would eventually result in the end of all spice production. This would mean the catastrophic collapse of society, along with other far-reaching and disastrous consequences. Dune has been called the first planetary ecology novel on a grand scale. The progressive themes of cause and effect are heavily woven throughout the course of Herbert's books. His work proved to have a definitive impact on human society, Environmentalists have even pointed out that Dune's popularity as a novel, depicting a planet as a complex and even living thing, strongly influenced environmental movements, such as the establishment of the International Earth Day. The environment of the desert planet Arrakis is known to have been primarily inspired by the Middle East, particularly the Arabian Peninsula and Persian Gulf, in addition to Mexico. The novel also contains references to the petroleum industry of those regions, which can be likened to the spice of Arrakis. There are many parallels that can be drawn between how the environment of this fictional world influences the structure of the universe, and how the environments in which resources are harvested on Earth in modern times have a similar impact on human society. There are many other lessons that can be derived from the novel as well. Lessons about the domination of native peoples and the greedy pursuit of natural resources, the lessons of blindly trusting leaders to always be right, and of the masses losing a healthy distrust of government. All of these themes back up what appears to be a common thought, which is to appreciate and understand the consequences of one's actions. This is certainly a lesson that Frank Herbert wanted to pass on to future generations, and as such, I can only hope that these themes are presented faithfully in Denis Villeneuve's newest adaptation. But let me know what you think about the ecology of Arrakis. Are there any other lessons from the book where you see modern application? Are you curious about how some specific elements of the environment work? Let me know in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe for more Dune and other sci-fi and fantasy content. Thank you all so much for your support, and as always, have a very nerdy day.